Um, kia ora koutou. Um, my name is Graham Burgess. I'm the Relationships and Engagement Manager for the uh, College of Engineering here at the University of Canterbury. Uh, a very well welcome, well warm welcome um, to our Brain Date AgriTech, which is our second in the series of uh, Brain Dates designed to bring industry and academics together uh, to share insights into their research, what they're doing, for industry to share what's happening out there in the real world and see if there's any sparks that fly through the conversation of the evening. Um, but before we get into this, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, in the unlikely event of an emergency, please just follow the uh, University of Canterbury staff. Uh, Mary's one, we'll wear a hand. We'll all just, everybody just chase Mary and, uh, and we'll be fine. Um, should we experience an earthquake, please just drop cover and hold and wait for the shaking to stop and then we'll all follow Mary again. Um, out, and we all meet just out in the grass out at the front. Um, for any other emergencies, the toilets can be found uh, to the left and the right of nuts and bolts just on the other side of the, uh, the core there. So we have 12 amazing presentations this afternoon for you. Uh, after each presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, but don't despair if you don't get the opportunity to ask or um, you don't fancy asking that question out in the forum. Um, we will be catching up uh, after this for some drinks and nibbles, so you'll have the chance to talk to them there as well. Um, if for whatever reason you've got to race away and you can't do that, uh, in your um, bags you'll find a leaflet with all their contact details in, so you can continue the conversation afterwards. Also after the presentations there'll be an opportunity to tour three of the wings uh, we have electrical, mechanical, and chemical and process engineering. So, um, so you'll be invited afterwards to, to join one of those tours if that's something of interest to you. Um, or if you don't want to go on a tour, of course, please just stay in network and we'll have drinks and nibbles all set up outside. Um, so let's crack into this with our first speaker. I'd like to welcome uh, Daniel Holland uh, up to the front, please. Okay. Oh, you've got a round of applause as well, which is yes. fantastic. Well, better to do it now than afterwards. Pretty good. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the, some of the work I've done on understanding granular flows, which has only been partly in agritech type applications, but uh, I think there are potentially some good applications in that sector. Um, and I'm from chemical and process engineering, so there will be a chemical and process type angle to this. Um, but just to start with, I thought I'd give you an idea about why I got interested in uh, granular flows because uh, that's also the reason why I think there are some interesting challenges with them. And this really comes down to the weird physics that they exhibit. And so people often talk about granular materials as behaving a little bit like a solid, a little bit like a liquid, and a little bit like a gas. Uh, and just to explain what I mean by that, well, if we think of a, a classical sort of problem in uh, many granular flow situations, we stick a material into a hopper and then we want it to flow out the bottom. And if it's all working nicely, then it flows a bit like a liquid, uh, and so we can say, well, that's all well and good. But we can take that same material and then stick it into a pile, and then all of a sudden it will pile up and behave in essentially a manner like a solid. Uh, and so then it's a bit more challenging to, to deal with. Um, but we can also think about then what happens when it goes into a different situation where it's got a, the ability to expand or compress. And this sort of compressibility effect uh, means that it can also behave a little bit like a gas. Uh, and so we, if we want to try and understand a granular material, we need to understand the solid-like behaviour, the liquid-like behaviour, and this sort of compressibility or gas-like behaviour. Um, and so I'm going to whirl through this, but basically just say that we can actually do this. We can simulate these materials. So this is a simulation of a hopper filling up and then draining again. Um, so we can do these computations to predict how individual particles combine and interact and then um, characterise what happens as the whole. But this sort of simulation is really difficult to do if you're talking about a real granular flow problem because we're limited to around about a million particles. Uh, and something like one of those granular piles just can't be handled. 
So we also have other codes which can produce models uh, like this one. And this is a um, profiles through this hopper and showing you the vertical velocity through it. Um, but this time based on a continuum description. So we treat the material very much like it's a fluid. Uh, and that works quite nicely and we can capture some interesting effects. But with both of these types of approaches, we need to know is the model actually any good? Uh, and with the model on its own, you can't tell that. So what we do is we use uh, magnetic resonance imaging like you would use to scan a person and measure what happens in these sorts of flows and you can get really very good agreement between the two. So it tells us that our models are actually really capable of describing what's going on. Um, but I also like to make things a bit more challenging. So those were dry materials, but we also like to test what happens when you have a little bit of liquid there, because liquid changes things. It changes things an awful lot. And so this is an experiment we've got going at the moment where we're looking at replicating that Newton's cradle toy. So this is where you have a series of balls on strings, and you let one go, and it knocks one off the end and the other end like that. But what we do is we put a little layer of liquid on there, and that totally changes the dynamics of what's happening in the situation. Uh, and we record it with high-speed cameras and try and understand um, what's going on. Um, and it turns out that you can still develop models to describe this behavior and get very interesting results. And so what we've got along the horizontal axis here is a um, velocity, essentially, uh, and a vertical axis is a coefficient of restitution, so how much it bounces. And what you can see is that until it, goes, it comes in with a specific velocity, you actually don't get them bouncing, they just agglomerate together. Uh, and then the amount they bounce depends on how fast they were colliding. But we can actually um, predict that. So this is sort of a theoretical angle for what we do. Um, but we also do other work looking at characterization of materials. And these ones are, are more directly related to fertilizers. We've studied uh, controlled release fertilizers and image the coating that's um, used to control the release rate from the fertilizers. Um, we've also done work to characterize surface coating materials and look at the chemical composition of those surfaces and understand whether the coating was um, sufficiently uniform to achieve whatever effect um, we were looking for. I can't say much more than that at this point. Uh, we're also doing a little bit of work in conjunction with um, the chemistry department here and Professor Richard Hartshorn. Uh, to develop pilot scale processes of um, chemical engineering type problems uh, and that allows us to test the materials that we might be using <coughs> in the process, uh, understand the reaction chemistry and how that affects things. Um, and again, I won't say any more about exactly what we're doing there, but this sort of equipment is possible and we, we have some of those working uh, here <coughs> in the department. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. We have a very short time. So um, basically, we can do stuff to predict the flow behavior of materials. We can measure material properties and characterize surfaces. Uh, and we can also test these ideas using a range of different experiments. So thank you. Just to give you an idea, I'll give these guys five minutes to present their, uh, their work. Uh, it, it doesn't come much better than that. That's fantastic. Um, does anybody have any questions for uh, Dr. Daniel Holland? So on those uh, fertilizer coatings, one of the problems they're seeing in practice is it hits those spinner discs that we've got there, and the coating comes off, and after a while you've got a sludge on those discs. So you have any thoughts about how that problem can be approached? Um, I, I have some ideas about how you could potentially look at that. With these sort of um, simulations, we can look at exactly what forces are experienced by particles as they contact one of those disks. Um, and so that could be an important way to think about it. Um, the other thing is you need to understand what the coating material itself is, and so why you're getting that deposit building up on the surface. Um, because that's going to be dependent on the nature of the material. Like if it's a fine powder, does it appear there? Or what's the mechanism for the particles to agglomerate together and, and appear on that, that disk? Um, yeah, so there are some things we could think about. Um, now, Daniel, will you be around later on for some conversation, or are you racing away? So I actually do have to race away um, pretty well straight afterwards, but I, my email should be in the back, <coughs> so people can get in touch with me through that. Fantastic. It's the easiest. Thank you very much. Daniel Holland. Now, if you just bear with me, and I'll just swap over some slides.
I'm quite excited by this, to be fair. Um, could I welcome Dr. Sarah Kessens up to talk about making ketchup on Mars? Excellent. Um, thank you for inviting me. This is the second time I've talked at a, a brain date, so hopefully this time I'll keep it to five minutes. Uh, we'll try. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in uh, UC Engineering School of Product Design. I've got lots of really fun, exciting projects I'm working on. Um, I come from a, an agricultural background, so it's really fun for me to get back into um, very traditional agricultural um, projects these days, like, like making ketchup on Mars. Um, so I'm a pretty big space nerd. Uh, pretty much, if I could be one of these astronauts hanging out and living on Mars, that's pretty much my, my goal in life. Um, but, but next to actually being up there, um, I would love to be able to design farming systems on Mars. Um, so have you guys seen the, the Martian? Yep, there, so this is, this is very important. Again, basically, what I would like to do with my research someday is actually do farming on Mars. Um, and so obviously, potatoes are, are quite important. Um, but if you've seen the Martian, as important as the potatoes is what goes on the potatoes, because if you run out of ketchup, you're putting Vicodin on your potatoes, and that's not ideal. So it's great if we could, we could figure out, like Matt Damon, how to grow potatoes on Mars. That's a pretty big challenge. Um, but I think an even bigger challenge than the potatoes themselves are ketchup. Again, we're, we're solving the big problems here at UC. Um, but, uh, but obviously, growing, growing one organism, on one, one plant on Mars is going to be difficult enough, uh, much less trying to, to make all the ingredients that go into ketchup. So we've got tomatoes. Uh, if we actually want to put some spice into this, this ketchup, um, things like peppers and garlic and, uh, and peppercorns, we've got all these different organisms that we're going to have to grow on Mars in order to get our ketchup. Um, and that's going to be quite difficult when really all the, the, the first things that we're going to be, gr be able to grow on Mars and on extraterrestrial um, bodies are going to be very simple organisms uh, like algae. The problem with algae is that it doesn't taste good. And so basically what I am trying to do with my research, one, one of the projects that I'm trying to do with my research, is try to figure out how to make algae taste good. Um, and in order to make algae taste good, we have to make the chemicals that make the algae taste good. And we've got a lot of great understanding about what the, the compounds in different foods are that actually make them taste good. So um, in the case of, of, uh, of peppers and capsicums, um, capsaicin is one of these molecules that tastes good. It makes, makes chili spicy. And how that compound is actually formed uh, in these chilies, um, basically there's some very simple molecules um, that go through a biosynthetic pathway to create these complex molecules. And that biosynthetic pathway uh, is basically the, the recipe book inside the nucleus of these plant cells. Um, so if we can understand what those recipes for producing those compounds are, then we can actually take those biosynthetic pathways and put them into other organisms. So it's sort of what I do for my actual day job. Um, rather than working in plants, I work with fungi. So we work with a lot of high value compounds in fungi, everything from uh, insecticides and agrochemicals to pharmaceuticals and antibiotics. And so what we do uh, in, in our lab is basically determine the, the biosynthetic pathways that make these compounds. Um, then we transform those into to simpler organisms, um, so model systems like Penicillium paxili. Um, and then we basically use those simple organisms as workhorses um, to produce at scale these high value chemicals. Um, and this is just a, a plug for, for my team. Um, recently spun out uh, a company there um, with uh, Wellington Uni Ventures based on the research that we've done the last couple of years. Quite exciting. Um, but back, back to actually getting ketchup on Mars, right? So we're starting out with this algae, which tastes sort of like seaweed, doesn't taste very good. Um, what we will actually be doing is, uh, is basically understanding the biosynthetic pathways to make flavors for ketchup. Um, so everything from uh, uh, carotenoids in tomatoes, allicin in, uh, in garlic, capsaicin, piperine, um, increasing the sugar content. So we're basically taking all these biosynthetic pathways, putting these into simple uh, organisms like cyanobacteria, um, and basically making those cyanobacteria taste like ketchup. Right? Sounds pretty far-fetched, um, but these are some of the projects that we're working on uh, in my lab. 
um, in addition to a lot of different synthetic biology projects. So not only making foods, fuels, pharmaceuticals, building materials. So we're, we're basically using genetic engineering and the power of synthetic biology um, to help basically develop these, uh, um, these uh, life support systems on Mars. Um, and so we're doing a lot of really cool synthetic biology here at UC. Um, quite a big uh, potential for, for developing things for space that can also have applications here on Earth as well. Happy to take any questions. How do I do? It's not a competition. <laughs> 14 just seconds. Bit, just, just a bit longer. <laughs> any questions for uh, Sarah? So, uh, yeah. Uh, very good presentation. Thank you for that. So, <coughs> was, um, thinking about your comment earlier, um, compounds and the relationship with flavor. Do you have any findings to share? I, no. This is this is very. We're very very beginnings of work. We understand the biosynthetic pathways for producing these different molecules, yeah. um, but we're we're the very very beginning stages of of the flavors, the flavor stuff. We've got other agrochemicals and pharmaceuticals that we're working on, but the, the flavor step is at the, the very beginning of the research right now. Yeah? Uh, I suppose it's not all about taste, it's also a bit uh, nutritional content. Absolutely. Uh, the algae by themselves are already nutritious, so do you want to do something else? Yeah, so there are several different species that we're, we're looking at. Um, so things like spirulina, if you guys are familiar with spirulina, it's, it's I mean, as, as complete of an organism for, for human nutrition as you can get. And obviously, we'll, we'll be working with a couple different species to get that right. So it won't be able to, to do everything. Um, but we're working with these species that will provide as complete nutrition as possible. Yes? That, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good I mean, we could, we could put in the biosynthetic pathways for uh, um, uh, coriander, right? And that probably wouldn't go over well for quite a few of the population. Um, so that is uh, something that, so we're actually working with some NASA scientists um, as to what, what astronauts enjoy eating. Um, obviously, taste buds and, and preferences do change in space. Um, but, but starting off with some simple things biologically and then working from there. Absolutely. So, no, we, we haven't looked into it that far yet, no. Brilliant. Just one quick question. Yes. Could you do aioli? Aioli? <laughs> that, that's, that, that's on the list, and we'll, we'll put that on the list for you, Graham. Brilliant. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Sarah Kessens. I'd like, now like to welcome um, Professor Richard Green to tell us about automating agriculture and agriculture. Uh, I'll need my timer just to make oh, sure I'll they stay the time. Uh, right, so um, I work with a lot of toys and I try and have more toys than anyone else because the person with the most toys wins. And this means like robots, drones, underwater drones, and a lot of fun things like that. So one of the things I get faced with by journalists, you know, when you get a $3 million grant to automate something, is you're going to put all these people out of work. And so I always remind them that, you know, a couple hundred years ago, we're all living on the land, working there, and most of us are now sitting in front of screens and keyboards. And there should be absolutely massive chronic unemployment based on where we were 200 years ago, and there's not. So clearly, society changes and adapts, so that's not a problem. And it was interesting, after I said that to every reporter who asked me this, they never ended up printing anything about automation causing unemployment. So yeah, that was an interesting response. So uh, th there's been a, a huge revolution in recent years in terms of the quality of sensors, the, the cost of processing power, the effectiveness and robustness of algorithms to the extent that it's pretty obvious from the progress we're ma making that within about 20 years, any repetitive manual labour task in, autumn, in agriculture or aquaculture can be easily and cheaply automated. So that's where we're heading. 
And it, so it's good to be thinking about that when we're thinking, how is New Zealand deploying its workforce and what are we training people for? So an example of one of the biggest recent revolutions is deep learning. So basically hundreds of layers of neural networks um, recognising objects, which seems like you know, it works really well, except you sort of notice that um, it's calling that cat and dog down there. So like, it's not perfect, you know, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So it just depends how good your training is, how well you know your domain. But it has been making really big progress in helping um, automating uh, automobiles, robots, and so on. Uh, for example, pruning forests. So 50% of our forests are on slopes so steep and rugged with big boulders and holes in the ground that it wouldn't matter how big the wheels are on the ground vehicle, we could never get a ground-based robot there. But we can get drones there. So we had a um, million dollars a few years back to attach something to drones that can cut branches. So what could possibly go wrong with this lethal thing flying around? Uh, surprisingly, uh, well surprisingly, like initially we were a bit sceptical, we it actually worked. So here's a drone in the lab, um, it's flying completely autonomous, um, there's no one controlling it, apart from someone racing around the background with the emergency stop button in case it suddenly loses control and pile drives through that net there. And so, uh, yeah, so there you see it just pruning multiple branches and then landing. It's quite interesting, almost the random movement of it. It almost looks as though there's some human controlling it, but it's just to do with the turbulence and so on as it's working. And at the moment, we're working on uh, even more accurate tools. So that's, you know, like centimetre accuracy. We're now working on towards millimetre accuracy at the moment. So that means there's a lot of <coughs> agricultural tasks that even on very remote places we can start to automate. Um, we had a, a large vine pruning project, and that was about a $3 million grant to prune grapevines. So another huge export industry. Most of our wine is Sauvignon Blanc um, from up north around Marlborough. And this actually worked surprisingly well. It actually you know, correctly uh, developed a 3D model of the vines, um, decided on a some AI deciding on where to cut an exclusion zone so it didn't damage the, um, the trunk or the stem, and then I would tell the robot where to cut. And it worked about, oh, 85, 90% of the time, which is completely useless for commercialisation. So big tick for MB, so I got a nice big green star from MB, but that's useless. Fortunately, uh, this project's being rebooted in about a $40 million project for both thinning applets and orchards and pruning grapevines. And now we know what not to do this time. So this time we're really absolutely determined to see it through to something useful for farmers. So, you know, like, we have a really big problem. We just can't get enough labour, especially this year. Uh, and we are working on about 0.5% of the whole world production. So this is an international um, problem, not, not just a New Zealand problem. Fortunately, there's lots of people making lovely little robots that are really cheap. So that's like about $100, and we added our bits to it from China. And we got another one that's about a metre by a metre that's uh, about 5000 So it's actually quite a low entry cost. And so now we've put a, a big stem of about six 12-megapixel cameras, and it just goes around scanning vineyards and orchards and um, does a very good job just autonomously. So suddenly for something way less than $20,000, we can offer farmers something to scan them every week giving them really accurate 3D models. A wee bit of a problem with having petabytes of data from each scan, but you know, um, that's, that problem's being solved by the cost of storage coming down. Uh, and then also adding a robot arm to that. So you know, then we've got LiDAR, of course, um, very sparse, so it doesn't have colour. It's very sparse, but still accurate depth values for, like, for example, vegetation enroachment on wires and trees and other things. And aquaculture, we're by far the most advanced in New Zealand in automating drones, underwater drones, and having them doing inspection, um, being able to hold them at any angle, um, a little arm to do something, so easily achieving six degree of freedom under the water. Uh, and we have a simulator using a Unity uh, games engine, which works so well, and we've published a number of papers, that for every line of code running on the drone in the simulator, the exact same line of code is running on the drone underwater. And so, um, I'm putting the time up signal here. So, uh, so uh, it's astounding how well this works now and how easy it is for us to test it without having to go and test it um, out. 
and you know, flying drones over um, objects to recognise them. That's getting easier and easier now uh, with deep learning, but of course you have to take into account weather, time of day, light reflecting off water. Everything seems really easy until you start to do it outdoors with all the, all the problems um, that you have with lighting and these we're solving. So there's a whole range of areas that we're working on. Did you just have the clip? No. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, wow, I just got blanked. <laughs> You're like you didn't turn the sound off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. Thank Thanks, Craig. So yeah. <laughs> Any questions for Dr. Professor Richard Green? Plenty. Right. Good question. So. Because of the turbidity in the water, like if you're going a few metres, um, you, we've got the sonar, but most of our work is close up, you know, within um, about half a metre or so. So if humans can't see, then neither can robots. So it's doing all the inspection, like biofouling on ship holes, um, salmon farm nets, wolf pylons. Um, the funding we've got is for um, mussel mussel um, farms. So we're looking at thousands of hectares of mussel farms, up to 10k off the shore. Uh, things like that, scallop beds. Yeah. How big is your team? Good question. So we've got a team of uh, about 12 PhDs and a couple of postdocs. And we've got a really good critical mass. And they're all, there's a lot of um, solutions in common across all these different areas that we're capitalising on. Yes, but that's a good question. And it's retaining that capability, which is the challenge here. And, and this that, is you managing all those? Yes. Right. And, and stopping them from going overseas. So we're looking at startups now. So the postdocs <laughs> don't disappear overseas. They stay here and want to make millions here working in startup companies. So that's sort of our pathway. Is there a question here? Uh, you said it's about 85% accuracy for the line pruning. Yeah, that, that you first one. About 99%, you know, it's getting up there. Yeah, otherwise, it's like driving a car. If it only works 99% of the time, you're really not going to be very happy with it. And so it has to be pretty good. We, we do compare how good an expert prunes compared to a novice, and so we do studies like that, so we can show that we're getting up closer to experts. Yeah. Uh, one more over here. Uh, robotic Wilkins has probably been around for about yeah. 15 years. Yes. But it really hasn't sort of gone ahead recently. Yeah. Mm. Have you got any comment on, on why it hasn't caught yep. on? Okay, so, so it is more common in Europe where and other, in America where they um, tend to have them indoors. Um, we're outdoors on the farm, so there is milking on demand, which works very well, but it's very expensive as well. And we've had um, one company, I won't mention hers, um, who did a bit of a trial of rotary milking sheds where you've got about 10 seconds to get the, teats on the, cu the cups on the teats. And uh, that was really challenging. So um, unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't go on with that. So it's the challenges, the cost... Um, and how relevant it is for when we've already got nice fresh grass outside. But for indoors, it has been cost effective overseas. Brilliant. Okay. That's a really green. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Already you're already here. You're already here. Um, I'd like to uh, present Dr. Claudia Mischrimmer. Nice from Lachlis. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, that's I gave fine. Okay. Was well, this horrible Austrian eggs, right? That's all good. Hi, Chiara. Uh, nice to have you here. So you already heard a bit about, um, yeah, how to modify organisms. So I'm working on that as well. And I'm usually also working on the application um, in agriculture. So my research in particular is kind of like interested in everything about plant health. And one of the big issues, if you yeah, want to realize it or not, is climate change in this context. And um, another part that is a huge issue in agriculture um, are pathogens. So and I kind of like I'm interested in both based on my past, back, my background in research. And so I'm going to give you a short insight into uh, into this search direction. Um, so, um, as I already said, we are working on climate change, and um, yeah, if you want to believe it or not, we can already measure differences in temperatures. 
Um, I'm not a meteorologist and I'm not working on the modeling for this, but I use them to kind of like understand that there's a huge difference between uh, global climate change and local climate change, like for example here in New Zealand. And we can expect different things, and so agriculture has to adapt to different things, right? So one of the things, for example, if you work for agriculture in Africa, we already see that we need um, high resistance against drought stress, against um, heat stress and uh, modifications for watering processes. Here in New Zealand, even in the future, we won't have it as harsh as in Africa. So we will have to adapt differently than agriculture in, um, uh, in Africa here in New Zealand. So, but some things, at least for plants, we have in common. Um, plants need to cope with higher temperatures, even here, because our agriculture relies on different species. Um, we might get some rising sea levels, so depending where you um, are working with agriculture, you have to consider, for example, water logging. And we have more uh, frequent extreme weather events, which is an issue all over the world. Um, and the change in rainfall patterns. And that's something we can already observe here in New Zealand. So this means in agriculture, so if we are talking about global um, expectations, we, uh, in some areas we will increase yields, and in other areas we will decrease yields. And um, sadly enough, um, the poorer countries are um, hit much harder by this because they will definitely decrease the yields. Whereas in New Zealand, there is a high possibility that we actually can increase yields. Um, we um, have also high impact on terrestrial ecosystems, which affects, for example, movement of pathogens. So COVID-19 is for exa an example for it. But we have the same also for plant pathogens. Um, we have drought and irre irregu excuse me, uh, irregular weather. Um, and uh, distribution of insects we are not used to. So uh, transfer of new pathogens and viruses we have not seen or are not used to here in New Zealand. And so this is just shortly um, a circle um, how plants are affected by this. So it all starts usually with that the photosynthesis goes down. And then we have some cellular regulations that lead to reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress production. It's basically the same um, than in our body. We produce ROS and we produce oxidative stress. It's the same in the plant. And in this vicious circle, at the end, we reduce the plant growth and we decrease um, the yield, which is not really optimal for agriculture, right? Because we want to have yield. And um, those are the most important stresses uh, we find. And in my lab, we are mainly focusing on drought uh, intensity, and we are looking also into disease and pests, as I already mentioned before. So we are in particular interested in dehydration of plants, also recovery, and then how um, plant um, health is affected by these mechanisms. And um, this is automatically also affecting how microbes are interacting with these plants, and we're talking about beneficials as well as pathogens. And we use different kind of technology for this because we try to have a, um, an insight on the pic uh, bigger picture. So I tend to say from the structure to the function, and I'm not talking pro about protein function, I'm talking about function of the plant. So we use phenotyping, which can be associated to um, computing as well as imaging, we use mass spectrometry, um, cell biology, as well as structural biology. And we do that very often in combination with uh, yeah, agriculture and um, with industries. So um, especially for indoor growth, so quality of light, but also combination um, of different um, yeah, cultivars in one uh, field. Um, so mixed cropping, for example, um, and the, um, or we support kind of like breeding uh, for stress-resilient cultivars and fast breeding. Yes, I can see. And um, just a short um, mentioning to at the end. So we're working in adaptation of plants, and most people don't think that plants are very um, yeah, active in uh, adaptation. So we can see here... Um, 
but that's not true. So here you can see a caterpillar eating, and this is a signal of the plant in real time. So you can see how fast it is. And this is from our lab, um, a salt boost, which gives the signal in the plant. So plants are not stat uh, static. They are not unengaged, and they are uh, definitely non not non-communicative. That's my take-home message for today. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, any questions for Claudia? Can you take advantage of those plant responses in the time something that's so set to know when there's, you know, like I take the plant at the edge of a field and the caterpillar starts eating it, that I can respond before the caterpillars spread them all? So that is a natural system. Um, so we can see now um, how fast this reaction is happening. We didn't know that until possibly 2015. Um, and what we know now is that the signal spreads through the plant. And in the other parts where the caterpillar hasn't started feeding, um, it induces defense mechanisms. For example, protease inhibitors. So they inhibit basically um, the hunger of uh, the caterpillar feeding on them. And um, so if we can make use of this, um, we can improve the system, hopefully, in the future. Brilliant. Thank you, Claudia. If, uh, if you have any other questions, Claudia, she will be outside afterwards. So um, track her down and, uh, and, and ask her all the questions. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Associate Professor Ken Morrison to come and talk to us about processing of plant protein products for New Zealand. Thank Some you, Good sure. afternoon. So a lot of people have been talking about proteins, alternative proteins, uh, in, in global context, and saying, well, you know, New Zealand's going to be moving away from meat, we're going to be moving to some sort of protein. And the, the question becomes, what? You know, what, are, what are we going to make? And I was talking to someone about this, and they said, well, OK, you're working on plant proteins, but what's your product? And that was a very good question earlier on, that, that if, if we don't have a product, we don't have a business. Um, and so what, what I've been doing over the last, well, it's about a year now, but a, a little bit longer, I dare say, in, in terms of some of the other work I've done, we need to be able to develop some special products in New Zealand that are unique to, perhaps unique to New Zealand, something that we can make better in New Zealand than perhaps the Canadians can with all their millions of, of acres or hectares or square miles of, <coughs> of peas. Uh, we need to, to do something. And to be able to move from this stuff, pea protein isolate, I'll use pea as an example because that's what we're looking at. And if you've tried this, anyone tried this stuff? It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. It, it feels horrible. It tastes horrible. Um, it's, you, you have to be a committed vegan. Yeah? <laughs> but knowing, knowing now that plants feel and react so quickly, I'm, you know, it's, it's a worry, isn't it? Um, but we need to be getting into much, uh, much more diverse um, proteins with applications. And this got me thinking really about New Zealand's dairy expertise. And my background is in dairy. Uh, I, I spent a number of years in there and a number of years in whey processing plants. And I, I think there's a comparison here that in, in way back, um, 1911 I've got there, we, we started making casein in New Zealand by a process isoelectric precipitation. And then uh, many years later, it was chemical engineers from this university um, and it was a lot of them that went out there and said, we can actually do something with the whey that's left over from cheese making, from casein making, and we can put ultrafiltration into plants and we can make these whey products. So that's the 1970s that they really started doing that. On this bit of lact album in there, another protein from, from whey. So in New Zealand, their industry since 1970s has been making whey, they've been making lact albumin, they've been recovering lactoferrin. They haven't just been producing protein. If you look at what the pea protein industry has done, they started in the 1970s to produce the equivalent of casein. And, and then you look at the literature, people are starting to talk about ultrafiltration. So I figure the plant protein industry is about 50 years behind the New Zealand dairy industry. 
And I think we've got an, a real advantage in here in thinking about products we can make, the sort of separations we can do in the scale that we can operate at. And I'm thinking it may be Sinlay or Fonterra that's producing the, the plant proteins. And it's interesting that Sinlay put that in the news just last week to say they're going to start processing some plant proteins. I have no idea what. <laughs> Now, uh, so the plant proteins contain a range of proteins, and, we, and, and when you get your pea protein, we don't even think about that. You just get the whole pea protein. Uh, there's albumins, there's the globulins, which you can divide up again. And I think we need to be thinking the same as we did with casein and beta-lactoglobulin and alpha-lactalbumin and lactoferrin from milk. We need to be thinking that same sort of uh, separation of different proteins from, from plants so that then we can have a, high, a range of applications that are very specific, the same way as the dairy industry does. So we've, we've done a bunch of research. Uh, we've got a, a, a lot of undergrad projects. I've, I've had about three design projects, getting a team on to do, do design. I've got two PhDs at the moment, concentrating on ultrafiltration of P, but it doesn't need to be P, to get the protein out of that, looking at, at functional properties and how we can process it. Um, we can do it on tiny scale, and we do it in a chemical lab so we can't eat it. So I'm, I'm quite excited that we may be able to do something with the School of Product Design and produce products at a larger scale and actually be able to eat it and taste it and, and show other people what we're doing there. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to being able to make proteins, pea proteins and other <coughs> proteins with a, a range of properties. Uh, that we can go and test. Uh, we hope to be able to separate out the different plant proteins and to find out the, the functional properties for those, uh, to look at the flavour, and, and then really to see what fits in New Zealand and with the sorts of expertise we've got in New Zealand that will be niche products that New Zealand can make. Thank you. Can you take that away? That's so five minutes. You're the new leader. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, any questions for Ken? Brilliant. Well, you'll be around later on uh, outside. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think you're... Are you giving a tour of Cave oh, It could well? be, yes. Yes, if I want it. So, brilliant. Keep yep. an eye out for Ken and, uh, and ask him plenty of questions later on. Thank you, Ken. Could I welcome to the stage uh, Justin Andrest from Callahan Innovation? Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, and thanks, Graham, for inviting me today. Um, so, uh, most of you probably know who Calivation, Callahan Innovation is. We're uh, New Zealand's innovation agency working with businesses to advance um, research and development in New Zealand. Oh, what did I do? Which is forward. Did I break it? There. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk today about how, how Callahan Innovation engages with, um, primarily with, with universities around some of our programs um, to get more, um, more of our STEM uh, students into um, business careers um, under, undertaking research and development. So the first thing um, uh, that we'll talk about is, um, is uh, the programs and then we'll go through and, and talk about some of the, the um, criteria and things around some of those programs. So um, for those of you that don't know, I'll go through this really quickly. Um, there's four main areas that Callahan Innovation works. We have research and development funding, um, grants, project grants, um, and uh, recently the research and development tax, tax incentive, which a lot of you will be um, getting familiar with, um, and, uh, and then student grants. Um, we also have, uh, we do innovation skills uh, programs, basically around best practice uh, kind of topics for doing your, your research and development. Basically, um, doing research and development more efficiently, failing fast, that kind of thing. 
Um, and then uh, we've got a whole big group of research and technical services, um, some of them based here at, at the university, actually. Um, and, uh, and, and working in these areas you see here, a lot of them you can, you can see have a lot of application into um, agri-tech areas. And then um, um, we do a lot of connecting. Um, and part of that connecting is, um, I did take my, my cap off, but um, events and delegations overseas where we take um, members from the university, um, academics come along, um, members from uh, CRIs come along, and we take companies and we support companies to uh, connect um, uh, internationally in, in those areas. So why student grants? So um, basically, we're, we're trying to help companies add more horsepower to their R&D efforts. A lot of times, I see companies that um, have a number of staff that undertake research and development in a um, slightly ad hoc way as they have time. And so often, you get people doing R&D getting pulled away from that R&D and back into the business. Um, so students can be a nice, dedicated resource um, to, 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 you know, get the R&D done. And so there are companies that I work with that I'm really pushing those programs when I see that they're that type of business. Um, so uh, the, the other thing that I actually see quite a bit is key... Um, key researcher risk. You know, there I've probably got a handful of companies where I believe the researchers are just world-leading, brilliant minds, and I want nothing more than to get a whole raft of students and people around them to kind of learn from them and, you know, clone their their knowledge and, and expertise. And because the reality is, sometimes those people, if something happens to them, there's a whole lot of knowledge that's going to get lost. So. Um, uh, that's, that's a real interesting um, <clears throat> opportunity for companies as well. Um, the other aspect of our student grants is assisting the student, right? Developing the student and the, and the company's commitment to that is, is their professional development and putting together a real good plan to mentor that student. And then for tertiary institutions, of course, um, there, there's a pathway for graduates, um, more employment, um, uh, and, and, and getting those numbers up of, of the student employed is, is really good. And um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is the experience grant. So this is great for Agritech because it's, a, it's support over, over the summer. It runs as a set round. Normally, this year it happened a bit late because of COVID. Um, normally it happens about April, May. We open up the, the application process and it, it usually stays open for a couple of months. Um, and it's 400 hours dedicated R&D support through, with an intern um, uh, in, in your business over the summer. They can start basically any time um, after the applications are approved. University doesn't even need to be finished yet if you want to employ, start them part time or whatever. Um, so a lot of field trial work, you know, that kind of thing works really well for, for um, experience grants. And, um, and there are caps on this course for, you know, big companies can take more. And it's, this is hugely about these students getting a good, a good experience and a commercial experience using their degrees as well, rather than working in um, the warehouse. So um, the next programs I'm going to talk about are the R&D fellowship grants. So these are uh, master's and PhD projects. Um, so you know where we have um, researchers in the university that are really commercially focused. Um, Richard Green is 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 one of them. Um, you know there's there's an opportunity for for companies to work directly with the university, um, and we fund those masters and PhDs at 100% um, um, for. Uh, a year, Ma masters can do their degrees part time, um, and PhDs obviously over over a three year period also lends itself really well to to ag agritech where you're having to prove things over multiple years. So um, the, these happen any time of the year, so they're an on demand product, and uh, um, but but the two it doesn't cover the tuition fees. Basically, the stipend is paid to the student, and the student pays the tuition fees. 
And, um, but, but a lot of times companies will, will top up some of those costs for the student as well. Um, then also we've got career grants. These are um, postgraduate internships. So basically a master's or qualified master's or PhD going into um, a, a company. We will fund that, that R&D effort through that, that employment for six months. Um, so basically it's $30,000 based on an annual salary of, of $60,000 for a master's student starting out and, uh, and based on an annual salary of $70,000 for a PhD. So we'll fund that first six months. That gives um, companies, you know, the ability to see, you know, is this, th this could be someone I want to employ long term, but that's um, not, not a requirement of that, of this particular program. So, um, and again, this is, this is about those new graduates, you know, there's a limited number of academic gigs, so we want to get them into companies doing R&D and, and really building up that, that R&D capability. And, and obviously, you know, they, they, get, um, they get a lot of support from, from the company as well. So basically with our programs, um, uh, you know, we encourage you to talk to us first, you know, um, seeing if, it, if it's the right fit um, for us uh, and, and the criteria that we have. Um, with some of the programs you find the student first, um, um, obviously with masters and PhDs and, and even the postgrad intern, you find those students first and then you apply, but the undergrad interns you apply and then find the student afterward. And so, um, yeah. There, there's the recap. Um, I've pretty much gone through all of that already. I'll just leave that there, I think, and uh, and just leave it. Uh, I'll leave it on that one in case you want to look. And any questions? Thank you, Justin. Any questions for Justin? You'll be hanging around later on as well. So uh, if you have any thoughts or questions for Justin, please just track him down and. Uh, and, and find out more about these grants. Thank you. Which, which, which presentation would you like to give us? I'll do the green one. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, could I introduce uh, Tim Ralston from uh, Ravenstown? Thanks. Thanks, Graham. Um, I was lucky enough to be at the engineering school at Canterbury, and in fact, Kim taught me at one point. And I'm just coming down from the PTSD of being here in November and worrying about exams, but I'm shaking it off, so that's all good. Um, so I'm now with um, Ravenstown, um, and I wanted to take you on, I suppose this is the first one related to kind of industry. Um, unfortunately, it's a boring history lesson, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, what actually has been happening in Agrotech at Ravenstown and in the fertiliser industry for the last 40-something years. Um, and importantly what's happening now and a couple of lessons learned which are really important to think about when you're commercialising things. So, first of all about Ravenstown, um, we are a co-op, 26,000 um, farmer owners um, and um, our why in the world, if you've got into the whole business buzzword of having a why, our one is uh, enabling smarter farmer for a better New Zealand and importantly one of the things that um, as a uh, fertiliser company originally we've changed from is by uh, reducing environmental impact and optimising value by the land and the order that those two are in is very very key. So I'll leave it there. Um, what we uh, do is obviously we um, not only do fertiliser but nowadays we're also an environmental consultancy, um, we have seed research and seed sales, we have egg chem, uh, I've got someone else here from Ravensdown, I might pop quiz, but that'll do. We've got lots of things. So we're far more than what was originally set up by the farmers as a, uh, a way to bring fertiliser and manufacture fertiliser in New Zealand. So there we go. Ravensdown was actually a hostile um, farmer takeover of two corporates. Dwell on that. In 1977. Um, and since that time, both Ravensdown and the industry have changed a lot. Um, so talking about things that were... Um, when that arrived, and we were kind of superphosphate, you may have heard of it. It's a thing that's been 1881. I think they were kind of smashing down bones and hitting them with sulfuric acid. Uh, so since that time, um, when Ravensdown was formed, quite a few things that probably at the time didn't seem like agri-tech. But I was thinking about agri-tech, and it's right anything since we were irrigating fields in something BC. So uh, we brought in high-analysis 
fertiliser. We started thinking about not just superphosphate. The old adage when you were a um, representative for Ravensdown was uh, super, superphosphate at 100 weight to the acre. It's the same, just tell everyone that. Um, so we started thinking about different, different things and different needs that um, crops and pasture would have. Um, would you believe that at some point we actually went, maybe we should use a model um, and uh, we should actually pump into a model, slope, aspect, all that kind of stuff, um, albeit that it wouldn't have been on a computer in those days, might have been in slide rule, who knows, but actually to try and understand exactly um, what nutrients are required by your farming system, which kind of seems pretty normal you do that now, but in those days, a bit different. The other thing we started doing was testing and actually working out, well, actually what nutrients are there in the soil um, and so, again, these things seem pretty simple now. You, it's a funny thing about agri-tech, looking back, you'd go, oh, that's not a big deal. Quite a big deal then, right? Um, the other thing, we brought in these things called compound fertilisers, where each granular fertiliser has the same amount of um, nutrients in it, which, that was a reaction to a more advanced drilling practices and stuff going on, where you actually needed to supply the right nutrient to the seed at the right time. Uh, we then worked out, well, hang on a minute, um, all the spreaders are just chucking it out the back and you've done all that modelling and you've got all that compound fertiliser, maybe not for drilling but for other things, maybe we should make sure we understand what swath widths or what kind of width that the spreader's spreading to. Um, and so um, in the mid-90s, it wasn't just Ravensdown, the fertiliser industry put together a spread mark to actually work out and work, do we know how much fertiliser is going on what bit of area? Then we got really fancy and we started putting it on a map for people. Um, and so it was um, the early 2000s when we started um, showing people where the spreading had occurred. Now at that point in time, uh, I don't think that many people cared. Nevertheless, through a brilliant business decision, we mailed 166,000 of them a year. And someone had a very sore tongue from licking those envelopes. But uh, <laughs> um, that was kind of the start. We've been a little bit ahead of the curve on some of this stuff. Then we decided, and this doesn't even seem that big a deal now, that when we took the soil test, maybe we could use a... Garmin e track from 2000 and something and take a point where that soil test was taken from. And so to this day now, where are we at 2020? We got about, farmers are still amazed, they turn up to a show and we go and show them on the, our mapping system, which I'll talk about in a second, and they go, we can show them all their records for 15 years about where it was and what paddocks, and they always go, I always knew that paddock was crap. Um, <laughs> but you know, isn't it amazing that you do this stuff and you don't even know what's going to happen out of it, but it comes along. Um, we then took the maps and put them online, and we've got an amazing um, department of coming up with names. I was involved in it. We called that one Map Viewer. Not very, I know, amazing, isn't it? Uh, but then um, also we purchased a company um, in the 2000s as well um, called CDEX, and one of the things that CDEX was developing, and it was through Massey University and a couple of guys doing their PhD there, was a pasture meter. So effectively that has an electronic uh, laser eye with a sensor on the other side, and it drags around the field, and you will be aware that in cropping situations, yield's been a thing that's been measured for ages, right? The combine harvesters will tell you exactly what point in the field. In pasture, that wasn't really a thing. Like, people walked out with a stick or a plate meter and just took the odd thing. This thing you drove around all the time, um, and you got, still to this day, probably the most accurate um, in the industry. I'm sure at some point um, satellites will take over, but at this point, still the most accurate way to prove whether all those nutrients you're putting on are actually working. And then we came up with something we were really excited about, which is a nitrification inhibitor. And that was called EcoN, the chemical's DCD, terrible name for a chemical. Uh, what it did was um, block the uh, um, nitrogen um, being created from the urine patch uh, into forms that could either leach or go up as um, greenhouse gases. Um, unfortunately, you may have read a little while, it ended up um, being sensed in milk powder. And unfortunately, there's no codec for it. And so we, Fonterra and Ravensdown made the choice to um, cease being in the market. That had massive implications for reducing nitrogen inputs, which was amazing, and we hope one day it'll come back in some form. So, kind of things were hotting up through that period, but in the 2010s, well, we decided to get into hardware, and let's build our own unit to do more variable spray, spreading and spraying, and so we have this unit that um, we've put into trucks and into our aircraft. We also have an aircraft fleet. Um, the other thing we did is we worked with um, NIWA and um, another company to put together um, a growth forecaster. So what this does is, remember that uh, pasture meter I showed you? Effectively what it's doing is measuring the average pasture, pasture, oh, average, um, pasture measurement in each um, paddock. 
and that's what those, those individual lines of paddocks. What this does is use newer forecasts and look at how you've benchmarked them against the algorithm benchmarks that are against how you've performed against the benchmark previously, and then animates the next 14 days of what, about what's going to happen. So if a suddenly comes up, go back on, because it'll show that you're suddenly going to go down. It also gives you the ability to um, do modelling around whether you put nitrogen on or not. And with the new government regulations on 190 kilograms of um, nitrogen need to go on, where this was like 5% of people doing this, it's going to be a whole heap more. So, yep. Um, and remember the pasture meter, well, um, Richard, it's now a robot. <laughs> uh, and so there's a couple of guys from another unnamed uh, university in uh, Palmerston North that I worked with Ravensdown um, to, to, to um, go out. And um, you see that thing, the one's actually running at Lincoln at the moment. It's going around and doing that pasture measurement. Again, no one has to ride it. It rides the same time. The only thing I remember people saying when we watched it out there was, it looks lonely. And it just wanders around at 6k an hour all day, every day. Um, but the other thing it does, is they're developing now, is looking at the pasture quality. So using um, different sensors on the front to understand the quality of the pasture, which is quite um, a kind of innovative thing. And the other thing it can do, of course, is it will be able to spot and spray and eliminate weeds. But those things are in development right now. Uh, we then, um, MapViewer got a revamp, and we got, we got deep into marketing and called it Hawkeye. So it was cool. Um, but really what it is is taking a whole lot of that stuff I just showed you and making it real to farmers. So what we can see there are obviously mobile apps. Have so many people come to me. I had someone in a show recently say, oh, I'm not a computer person. And she was from a town on the west coast that one of our shareholders, and she pulled out a brand new iPhone, whatever we're up to, 12. I said, what's that? And she goes, oh, it's my phone to do everything on it. I'm like, yeah, you're a computer person. <laughs> um, so really trying to, and this is a key point for how we commercialise and do this stuff is, how do you get it into, not 5% of people's hands, but 80% of people's hands? And that's my role in Ravensdown. Um, what you can see here is people monitoring what the plan was based on all that science, that's the plan there, and understanding what actually happened, and then working out how I'm going against the plan. Real simple stuff, I don't know whether you call it agri-tech, but this is stuff that's making it real for you know, um, thousands of farmers. Uh, another thing we worked on um, that actually was with Lincoln is something called ClearTech. And so that's using uh, water treatment uh, technology that I believe is from kind of using water treatment in third world countries to take effluent feeds out of dairy sheds and um, recycle the water back for cleaning water. And it, by the way, the, um, uh, the Flocculant actually kills some of the um, E. coli as well. And so I think if dairy farmers were to use this technology, all of them in New Zealand, it's 42 billion litres of water saved a year. Now, that would be great for Ravensdown, but we're getting there. It costs a bit to put them in. But um, certainly um, also when we had Embovis, um, heaps of the truck uh, trucking companies that were shifting and had to go through amazingly huge different kind of hoops to actually clean their trucks started and, and a few of them have put these in. So exciting stuff. Uh, there's always plain sensing stuff. So our latest PGP, I think we're literally in year six of seven on it, is around hyperspectral scanning from the air, um, focused predominantly on um, sheep and beef farming in hill country and building a model that from, with, with that hyperspectral can understand the fertility or possible fertility of that um, pasture. We then add all the things we've got, soil, slope, everything like that, and we've worked on a model that um, can uh, then come up and tell them uh, where, that, um, where the best place to put their fertiliser is. Um, and then the other thing we're working on with people here at Canterbury is how could we actually put monitoring in the water so we can actually prove what's going on, live monitoring around N, P, sediment and bacteria. So, a couple of lessons. Um, one of the big things is, and I, someone famous said that once, but it's actually what you're not doing. There are a million, a million, maybe a billion good ideas, and the hardest thing at Robinson, or any of the agribusinesses, is sitting down and going, which one's actually the one we should do? Um, and so it's a real challenge, and we work really hard on that in prioritising. Uh, we need each other, and I mean the industry, and that's the hard thing. There's lots of commercial, as you can imagine, kind of tensions and all sorts of stuff going on and, and patch stuff. It's got a million times better and we're heading in a great direction, um, but it is a lot of work. And the other thing is something being cool isn't enough. We talked about farmers, how do we get them using it? Like, they can get really excited because it is cool, 
uh, but we need to prove that it um, helps them with a problem they have and helps them in a way that they can tangibly see the result of. Because everyone's out there selling them, hey, do this in two years you'll see this. Really hard to back on, right? Um, but by, by the way, it's still cool. <laughs> uh, lastly, the last thing I want to talk about was the journey for Road Down. All this technology in agritech still, in my mind, centres on uh, Hatangata or the people. It's all about people. We still get, it's all about how can we make their lives. When we talk to farmers, they go, give me more time to farm. When we talk to our staff, they say, don't throw all this technology on, make my life easier. It all gets down to personal relationships, just like agriculture always has and always will be, um, especially in these areas where it's remote and they, they sometimes feel a bit hard done by, by um, other people. So um, that's a real key thing around any technology, thinking about the psychological and benefits of it. So, yeah, that's me. You didn't give me a sign on it. Oh, do you want to? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> it was long, long after your allowance. Oh, right. um, any questions for Tim? Brilliant. And you'll be around later on as well? I will, yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tim oh, from uh, Rainbow uh, Stand. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Missed you there. With all the precision um, agriculture, yep. what sort of savings are you making on, you know, farmers making on their fertiliser um, in terms of the environment? Yeah, um, I, I think it's a really hard thing to actually answer and say it's this. Um, it really depends on, I suppose, and this is going to sound like a politician's answer, right, but because they're such complex systems, it kind of depends on not only their procedures there and what bits of the technology they've taken up, but I, I know people that have, for instance, over a period of four or five years, halved end bills. You, you know, like, um, if you, the really good thing to read about is Lincoln University Dairy Farms' journey over the last think, decade around um, what they're doing with N. Um, that's amazing, where they've challenged themselves, um, given all the complex environment, commodity prices, everything, to have their, I think it was half their email, something like that. Um, it's a great, um, if you flip me an email, I'll find the documents in queue. It's a great read. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Lovely. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Tim. Thank you. I'm really excited to introduce now um, Ross Mill from Lyft, who's going to. Um, why don't you, you're not actually on here? What are you going to talk to us about? Uh, I'll give a little bit of an introduction to what Lyft is because that might be uh, new news for a lot of people in the room. Brilliant. Cool. Well, I'll leave you to it, Ross. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Ross Mill. I'm actually a, a Canterbury grad as well, so it's a pleasure to come back here tonight. And there's a little bit of a theme going on because I was also taught by Ken. Uh, <laughs> Maybe uh, <laughs> there's a long there's a long career there. We can get into that later. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, Leaf Foods and uh, who we are, uh, what we're up to, and it also happens to follow on a little bit from the same theme as Ken was talking about. So uh, first of all, Leaf Foods is uh, very much a startup company. Um, we are pre-revenue, pre-profit, so we are experts in spending money. Um, and uh, we've been going about a year and a half now. Um, our mission uh, is to create high quality sustainable plant protein grown by farmers who care. And I'll explain a little bit more about how we do that. Uh, but firstly, I'd like to provide a little bit of background and talk about the two fundamental drivers that uh, led us to forming Leaf Foods. So firstly on the consumer side, um, looking at those big global trends which are happening at the moment, Plant protein is one of them for a variety of reasons. Um, we see a whole lot of uh, people shifting towards plant protein, and we even see that in New Zealand. So you're, you'd see that every week you go to the supermarket, there's more and more plant protein products on that supermarket shelf. You probably also see it at home. Uh, you know, it used to just be that blue top sitting in the fridge, and now we see there's a plant alternative potentially sitting beside it or even replacing it. Uh, and it's an it's a, it's a established market already, so it's not necessarily new, it's already worth 15 billion which is a considerable size and there's an opportunity for New Zealand to be involved in that. The other driver for us was around the environment and more, more locally to us, uh, the challenge that we have in particular here in Canterbury uh, to reduce emissions from our current agricultural practices and to do that in a way that's uh, economically viable uh, and it is, it is a significant challenge. Uh, Where's DCD? Where have you sat down? I mean, that's, 
you know, that's one, uh, one solution, uh, unfortunately not available to us now. Um, so we need uh, multiple solutions to that. And uh, the concept of Leaf Foods is to bring these two things together. And I'll firstly talk about the consumer uh, and how we achieve that. So on the left-hand side, we start with uh, crops, uh, crops that we're familiar with growing in the Canterbury Plains. Now, New Zealand is uh, great at growing pasture. So what we're talking about in leaf foods is green leafy pasture. So we're talking about, uh, we're not talking about pea protein or soy protein that comes from the seed, but actually protein that comes from the leaf material. We can come along with a mobile juicing unit and extract a portion of that protein and transport it to a manufacturing facility. Manufacturing facilities, this is where our chemical and process engineers come in and look at how we isolate and extract the protein that we're after. The protein that we're after is a really interesting protein. Many of you in the room may know it already. Uh, it's called Rubisco, or predominantly Rubisco. And it's interesting because uh, when you isolate it, it's white, tasteless, uh, and odourless. Um, now that might not sound very interesting, but from an ingredients point of view, that's exactly what we're after for use in food products. So we can take that product uh, and we can work with it with our food technologists and look at how we put that into products uh, that we, uh, you know, we love to consume every day. If we, before I do that, um, the target here for Leaf is to create a scalable business. So initially we came into this looking at uh, a B2B ingredients play. And that's because we want to have a tangible impact on the environment. So be it, to be able to do that, we need to be doing this at scale. And if I switch back and sort of go back towards that mobile juicing step and talk about you know, how do we create that positive impact on the environment, uh, I mentioned that we take a portion of the protein uh, out and transport it to a manufacturing facility, but we leave a portion in, uh, in the other stream. If we look at the challenge that we have, uh, it's great that we feed our, feed our animals on pasture out, outdoors. But associated with that is that we're feeding them excessive amounts of protein. And if the animal doesn't utilise that protein, it goes through the animal and comes out the other end as nitrogen. So nitrates into groundwater and nitrous oxide into, into the atmosphere. So in our solution, if we can take the right amount of that protein out of the system and leave uh, leave an amount that matches with the animal's requirements, then we can significantly reduce the emissions from that animal when we're talking about nitrogen. So this is a, these are some pretty ambitious goals, and in order to achieve them, uh, we need to work with the best, uh, the best people in New Zealand. So we've got a great team of internal people. Uh, there's Anne and Sonia who are at the back of the room going, why did you put a picture of me up on the screen <laughs> uh, in one of our trials? Um, but we also work with a range of CRIs uh, and universities, including the University of Canterbury, and we also work with Cullohan Innovation as well. Uh, and I'd like to draw on what you said, Ken, in terms of that, uh, that transition that the dairy industry went through. And to go through that tr transition and the production of whey products, it took a lot of effort you know, from multiple people across New Zealand in the days of DRI, for example. And this will be a similar task or a similar challenge and journey uh, in order to valorise products that come out of plant material and take them through to human consumption. What we're t doing and what we're talking about is just the start of this, uh, so I'd encourage, you know, since we're here at a university, I'd make the pitch to continue to invest in this area uh, and ultimately, from an indus industry point of view, we need to hire great talent, and this is where it comes from. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well done, just smile. For... Smile for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions for us? I'm um, just wondering, what, how you select So there's a number of factors that we're selecting on. Uh, from a farm system point of view, we're looking at crops that farmers are familiar with, uh, that grow well here in Canterbury, uh, that also have uh, the protein that we're after, or large amounts of the protein that we're after for extraction, and uh, also that... Um, 
that we're able to extract the protein from. So it becomes, from an extraction point of view, what other compounds are there which are not desirable uh, that we need to, to remove. Um, and, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah. What's some examples of those crops that might be suitable with the same for a Cambrian region? Uh, so we work a lot with lucerne. Um, so the concept in terms of extraction of rabisco has been around for some time. Uh, actually dates back to 1942 when someone first thought of this idea. Uh, and for a number of years uh, through the 70s, in fact, uh, alfalfa or lucerne was studied predominantly because of its high protein content. Uh, so we've started to work with that. Uh, it was an easy starting place for us. And now we're looking at what other crops would also fit well in the farming system here. Uh, yep, so uh, just for clarif clarification, um, we're an R&D company at this stage, so we're pre-commercialisation. Um, so like I said, we're just flat out spending money at this stage. Um, and our model will be from end to end. So looking at it uh, from paddock all the way through to an ingredient, either supplied to another uh, food processor to put into the final application, or potentially moving into that application space as well. One quick one at the back. You about extracting some of the protein from the farms. Does that mean that you really need to integrate the stool with a perhaps a dairy farm or something that's going to then consume the, the non, or what's left after you process it in the field? Yeah, that's, that's right. So um, if we can optimise the protein, so you're correct, we take a portion of the protein out, and what we're trying to do is leave the right amount of protein in that feed material that matches, for example, with the lactating dairy cow, the requirements of the lactating dairy cow. So we could maintain the same amount of milk production and create an additional rev revenue stream uh, for that farmer. Fantastic. Thank you cool. so much, Russ. I appreciate that. And again, you can catch up with all of these people outside afterwards and... Uh, ask them some more questions. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Frederico Tomasetta and uh, Munir Sahar sure. Sahar yeah. uh, from Ag Research. Thank you. I think from Thank a you. practical point of view, I will step on one side and then cool. I will join Munir later on. Okay. Cool. Um, hi everybody, I'm Munir and um, I'll be co-presenting with Federico. So we are from Egg Research. So just a quick introduction. So we are one of the seven CRIs, and uh, we mostly do research to support agriculture sector. So just a quick snapshot of the type of things we do. Um, we do work with animal, um, farm systems, environment. Some of the projects are also in food and bio-based products and forest science as well. So we'll give you some um, glimpses of some of the projects happening at Egg Research in these fields. Okay, so um, last year we started a um, multi-year, about five-year program called NZ Beta. So that is about $25 million investment and it will be over the, uh, five years. And the key focus is to do some multidisciplinary um, projects, um, mostly focusing on uh, digital technologies, like of artificial intelligence, data science, sensing technologies, um, and also look at the social side of it as well. So how you can uh, make these technologies actually work for people, farmers, and other stakeholders in the industry. Um, so we are already uh, have about two um, internships from University of Canterbury this year, and there will be a lot of opportunities for internships or engagement with academia uh, in this program as we go forward. Okay, so some of the quick glimpses of the projects in different areas. So this is a project we recently completed that's much more thinking 
Traditionally, um, people have been thinking about more reactive approach to um, productive risk, whether there will be a, um, fertility this time or not. Um, so we are taking, looking at the wide range of uh, different data sets for individual animals, and we're testing for about 50 odd animals to see if you could predict early enough that, okay, what would be the risk for production? And then farmers can make some good decision early on about the animals. So there's a lot of work happening in animal welfare space as well. I think that's a hot topic um, at the moment. And this particular project, we looked at um, thermal sensor, so thermal cameras, whether we could look at the eyes of the sheep and see if we could uh, detect any signs of stress on animal. And that actually, this is already a published uh, paper. So if you needed a link, I could send it later on. So in farm system space, um, this is a project we are um, trialing at the moment uh, to see how uh, it actually works in reality. So that is much more helping farmers to um, manage their grazing, manage their animals remotely. You don't need a physical fences, so you can uh, put a virtual fence and you can control your animal movement on the paddocks. So there is, in food science space, um, there's a lot of work happening like in a biochemistry and uh, that area. In this particular project, actually, we do mostly with animals, but there was enough capabilities in egg, at egg research that we were able to start a project um, to develop a rapid test for COVID-19 um, from saliva. So we managed to get this DART, a mass spec machine from a company from Singapore that can actually, um, it was about 1,000 different molecules within seconds, and it could work quite a mobile, uh, smaller size compared to some of the other machines. And um, we're getting some good early results. I think we're still working on it. Hopefully, it might be a successful thing, and it will come out in a couple of months. So um, the other things we are looking at is food analysis itself for either food authenticity or food quality control. And this is a one project where we are looking at developing some um, deep learning using um, high perspective imaging. And a um, couple of things we have done there is develop some 3D convolutional neural network models. Um, we're getting some good results, but I would say this, this is a lot of work still to be done for this work to go it as a, some kind of production solution. A uh, couple of quick things. Um, so a lot of work is happening in artificial intelligence space, but there are some bigger challenges. One is solutions works for proof of concept, but they do not work as a generalized solution in a production space. So that's one of the biggest challenge. And the second challenge is about measuring uncertainty. Like, okay, you get some predictions, but how how that helps in my decision making, that's quite a big challenge at the moment and we are working on it. So I'll quickly hand over to Federico for a couple of slides. Thank you, everyone. So I'm working in the forage science team and what I'm showing you now, it's, there are about three or four, uh, three, four projects that we, I'm very excited to work with, uh, collaborators within Ag Research and external collaborators. So the first project is with the PGG Rights on Seed in collaboration with China Agriculture University, thanks to the New Zealand-China Food Protection Network. So what we are trying to develop is a uh, digital application called Hypertrades, which will detect the status of the plant health in New Zealand pasture ecosystem using near-infrared and hyperspectral uh, uh, sensors. Uh, why is it important to detect the plant health? Because the increasing the information of the plant health um, will actually uh, improve the crop yields and also the uh, forage uh, production and quality. 
So in this case, what we're aiming for is to develop uh, an innovative uh, imaging uh, workflow using uh, multispectral and hyperspectral sensors, so in deploying uh, uh, satellites, um, drones, and also stationary sensor, and uh, in, together with machine vision, so um, AI automated image classifier and big, da big data sensing to detect uh, healthy plants versus the stress plants. I just want to show you some preliminary results. So on the left, uh, there are um, there we we sample uh, ryegrass, which is one of the most common plant uh, plant species in, in the farm and in pastoral ecosystem in New Zealand. And the right uh, figure shows you clover plants, actually and same same very um, uh, um, used plant in the farms. And as you can uh, see, the signatures from stress plants uh, differ from uh, plants uh, with a healthy status. The stress were abiotic, which uh, we basically uh, um, use um, irrigation and non-irrigation or uh, uh, temperature. And also the biotic stress was uh, using pasture pest. When we fed the, this data set to a machine learning uh, algorithm, in this case support vector machine, the accuracy of the algorithm that detecting uh, healthy plants versus stress um, was up to 80%. Another project we are working on, in collaboration with Assure Quality and the uh, uh, Foundation for Arable Research, is to develop a, a digital application called Hyperseeds, where we are trying to accelerate the process of seed testing. So conventional techniques for seed testing are quite expensive. They take, take a long detection time, skillful human manipulation. And in this case, what we're aiming for, again, it's an imaging workflow. I just want to show you some uh, preliminary results. So we use six cereals, uh, manually and uh, uh, labeled. And then we scan those seeds using a hyperspectral imaging. In the lab, we created a data set, and as you can see, we could distinguish uh, spectral signature of the six seeds. And when we fed this data set to a machine learning algorithm, we managed to uh, have an, an average of accuracy of about 80% of detection or identification of those seeds. The next uh, last project I would like to show you, it's uh, in collaboration with Bayern uh, Crop Science uh, Lab. So we are, what we are aiming uh, is to use the, this teaching technology for detection of chemical residual. Yes, you can imagine uh, detecting chemical, chemical residual is a very crucial issue for uh, agricultural contamination and food quality and safety. Again, we, we just want to show you some preliminary results. We use 25 experimental plots, so field plots, and we measure and detect the spectral signatures of spray ryegrass, in this, in this case against unsprayed ryegrass, using a, an insecticide. And uh, when we fed the, this data set to an algorithm, to a machine le learning algorithm, we could detect sprayed versus unsprayed uh, grass even after uh, two days with an accuracy rate of 90%. We also use another uh, 25 experimental plots, in this case with, right, um, with clover and uh, sprayed with herbicides, and there were clearly spectral signatures for sprayed and unsprayed clover. And uh, in this case, again, the machine learning algorithm gave us another, again, 90% of accuracy to detect sprayed versus unsprayed grass. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, any questions for these guys? None, none out there. But uh, you'll both be around uh, outside afterwards to, uh, to answer any questions. And if you do think of some, of course, um, all their contact details are in the brochure in your bags. So you can fire emails <laughs> through if you want some more information about the work that they're working on. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome next um, Kenneth Irons from Precision Farming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenneth. 27 down, two to go. Good afternoon. <coughs> Although my company logo is on the wall, I want to speak to you primarily under the in my capacity as Chairman of AgriTech New Zealand. 
which is the peak industry body for the agri-tech sector, came together in May this year by a combination of the original agri-tech, which was focused very much on startups and the supply of technology, and it merged with the Precision Ag Association of New Zealand, which has been around for many years, had been focused on farmer adoption, so it was kind of the pool side of the market. So the reason I wanted to talk to you from that perspective is although Precision Farming as a company has been around for 14 years, I became the sole owner of it in July, in June. Um, it, it wasn't really so much from that perspective that I wanted to speak. So I'd like to ask a quick question with a quick show of hands. Of the two kind of categories that we might have in the room, those coming from the uh, academic or, in, or the academic side, or those that consider themselves to be in the industry, who would see themselves as being industry focused? I just have... OK, that's probably, I don't know, I'm guessing 60%, maybe. So um, wh why I ask that is because um, I started out life uh, 100 years ago, as you can... I'm just kind of adding up everybody's age in here. I think you almost total my age on my own. Um, uh, I started out many decades ago as a pharmacist. And the, the role of a pharmacist is to leave the, the uh, diagnosis to the, to the medical practitioner. And it's very much about getting the right medicine into the right patient at the right time for the right reason. And I've wandered through three other major industries, media, um, airlines, and c corporate banking, which you'd have to ask why on earth, on earth those three. And then I arrived in Agritech uh, seven years ago. So it was an interesting segue. I'd come from corporate banking in London, came back to Christchurch here. Um, but the, there's a, there is a bit of a theme. And the reason I'm mentioning all this is because what I've identified is, from my perspective, because I'm not an ag tech person, I've tended to ask why things are done a certain way. What, what's consistent with particularly those three industries I mentioned in the middle, less so medicine, um, um, medicines and hospitals and you know, the medical world generally remains to be relatively undigitised compared to, say, airlines. I mean, think back 20, 30 years ago when you had to go to a travel agent with a piece of paper to find out just to get yourself on a plane, completely digital. I'll tell you a little story. When I was involved in that, in that game, would be early 80s, I had a pharmacy that I had a very, very early computer. It was a double five and a quarter inch floppy drive Zeta computer. It cost me the same price as you'd pay for a mini miner. And uh, I had somebody call on me who was, the, who was the then executive director of the Travel Agents Association of New Zealand. And for a reason I won't go into, I happened to show him this comp particular computer that I had running in the pharmacy. And he said to me, computers, he said, they will never have any a role to play in the travel industry. <laughs> so much for foresight. Um, but uh, but the, the airline industry, the travel industry generally, imagine it now without it being digitised the way it is. Banking, imagine it, how it being digitised, not digitised the way it is. Um, I have a tangential relationship with the supermarket business. My brother used to be chairman of foodstuffs in New Zealand. And so I watched that industry from, through my brother's eyes for over his career and watched the digitisation of the food supply chain at the front end, at the supermarket end. When I came into Agritech, um, I identified it pretty early on. There's many, many more, way more qualified people than I have, have identified it. And that was that it remains to this day, relatively speaking, quite undigitised. Microsoft says it's a trillion dollar industry to be digitised, there are a trillion dollars worth of value, and they apply that to only one other industry. Any idea what that might be? Any quick answers? Medicine. The opposite, what was that? Medicine. Well, medicine's half, halfway there. The one that's... The, biotech. Uh, sorry? Biotech. No, biotech's, well, relatively speaking, I'll tell you the one that they think it is, construction. Um, you've got something similar between a, a plethora of plumbers and builders and and you know, paper hangers and glaziers trying to get work done in a, some kind of coordinated fashion, and yet it's recognised as a very, very large number of small businesses in that industry. And somewhat farming's the same. How many banks are in the world? Or how many airlines are in the world? Pre-COVID, 6,000. How many hospitals? I think 225,000. Um, how many banks? Roughly sort of the number. How many farms in the world, if you include subsistence farms? 550 million. Of those, about 20 million are commercially significant around the world. So here's my question to those that are in the, in the um, consider themselves to be in the industrial side. What is it that you are trying to do? Where do we fit? Where do we each fit in the value chain in terms of how we move digitalisation into capturing that trillion dollars, or let's say they're 50% wrong and it's only half a trillion, 
um, Microsoft is, um, how do we move a greater degree of uptake? Because where I live and breathe in a, in a day to day basis, in my day job, my professional career, is right up against the literally carrying gumboots in my truck. I've got staff driving around New Zealand in trucks, going and implementing technologies on farms and hooking it up and making it work, helping decision support, helping decision security. We live and breathe right up the front end. So this is absolutely fascinating what we've been hearing today. It's, some of it's really leading edge technology, but it's when I'm someone in Tikawiti who's running a dry stock farm and got you know 10,000 stock units and got a phone that won't connect to the internet because he's too far from a, from a cell tower, that's the real world. So how do we, of us that are in that sector, how do we actually move a much greater, the needle much further over into deeper, deeper adoption? Because until we can do that, I don't think we're actually going to get the degree of uh, feedback loop that's going to accelerate the rate of uptake. Of course, a lot's happened, no question. To what extent are you are familiar with the government's industry transformation plan, the Agritech Industry Transformation Plan. Have you ever have you heard of it? Not that many hands, only three or four. This is, a, this is the first of the industry transformation plans to be released. It was released, should have been out in February, but COVID got in the way. It was released formally in July by then Minister Twyford. Minister Stuart Nash is taking it on now. Um, that's really quite a robust project. But I've got to say that from working as I do now uh, with a lot of entities around the world, I'm part of the digital, uh, the data, uh, data-driven agricultural futures initiative out of uh, Europe. Uh, five or six countries, 11 of us on a, on a team of people working on that. Um, we're very closely tied with Australia. There's a lot of things going on in a lot of countries. And New Zealand has not got a free ride in being um, a, a, a strong player globally when it comes to significant contributions to global agritech. You look at the various maps and schemas and research that's, that comes out of Europe and the, and the US and North America generally, and so often it's just our geographical location, all sorts of things. You see bubble graphs and all sorts of things of activity going on around the world, and in some, a lot of those uh, considerations, New Zealand does not even get a dot, let alone a big dot. So between what we've got here, we've got a big focus on what we're trying to do, but my sense is that having looked at what we're doing in New Zealand, fantastic work that it is, we've got a steep hill to climb in terms of a rapidly increasing awareness across the world of the importance of agri-tech. We're up against, uh, we, we're collaborating indeed with a number of companies, countries that are of similar size to us, Denmark, the Netherlands, Israel, Singapore. Um, there's a lot of activity going on there. I was part of a forum with a group of New Zealand trade and enterprise executives through Asia, uh, uh, 10 or 11 of us on a call just last week. Really fascinating work that's going on in some of those countries. I certainly encourage those of us who are in academia to recognise that those of us who are in industry that want to grab this, the quality work that's being done and move it through into the place where it actually grows more grass, creates healthier animals, captures more of the value chain for farmers to bring back from too much of the rent seeking happening post the farm gate. There's a lot of activity there to be able to capture value and bring it back onto the farm and enable farmers to get a better return on their invested capital. And those are really important economic drivers for New Zealand. So I would encourage those in academia to recognise the importance of getting your research exposed to those who can commercialise it as quickly as possible. Those that are in the industry recognise Three things. One, that globally we're insignificant as a country. We believe our own press releases. We listen to our own echo, echo chamber. But in so many markets, we don't even get a mention. Secondly, we've got a lot of very qualified people, but we're somewhat disaggregated. There's a lot that we, more, more that we could do. And thirdly, we've got a tremendous amount of support from the New Zealand government and its, and its newly elected uh, horsepower in the House and with the new ministers. Um, Agritech New Zealand is doing its little piece of the whole puzzle, but there's a great infrastructure there. Um, there's, we're probably half the members that we could have, but it's a great forum. There's a, a lot of activity, there's a lot of momentum, and it's rapidly growing. So I'd encourage those who are in, in industry, if you want to connect, you want to inter, uh, interface, you want to uh, interoperate, share your technologies, uh, take friction out of the market so that when products arrive on the farm, they are not disaggregated. You know, it's the 50 apps on the phone problem that farmers have. One app doesn't talk to another. 
That's a big issue that we need to overcome. So uh, we've got great opportunities, but we've got some hills to climb. We've got a lot going for us, but it's not going to be a walk in the park. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions if anybody would like. Questions for Kenneth? There's plenty of food there for thought. Um, please uh, feel free to catch up with Kenneth when he gets back. Um, I'd like to welcome PGG Wrightson, hot off the press, just racing on in here. Um, thank you very much for coming over. I know that you've had a really busy day on a planning session. Um, hopefully you've caught your breath because your timing is perfect. <laughs> Milton Monroe. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. It's all yours. Excellent. Right. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I do apologise. I didn't realise that they were going to mic me. I probably would have warned them first. Uh, it's a pretty large room that I, uh, my voice doesn't fill. Especially when I start getting excited about something, I'll start getting very loud. So I uh, do apologise to everyone. Okay, today I want to talk to you all about agricultural problem solving and the critical role that agritech can play in helping us there. So, uh, first of all, PG Ryson, we are New Zealand's largest agricultural supply company. We do everything from livestock, wool, real estate, through to the part of the business I work in, which is our retail offering. This is farm supply products. And we deal in troubleshooting here. We deal in problem solving. And I really want to take you through the, the basic premise of problem solving in agriculture. I mean, first step, and it's, you know... We identify a problem. We find something that's not working out there on farm. And we start going through a bit of a program on how to, how to fix it. And it's really a very simple three-step process. First thing, we collect the data. We try and find as much data as we possibly can about the problem. We try and capture as wide a collection of data as we possibly can. Now, as you'll all be aware, data by itself taken as a single observation is completely useless. We actually need to apply some sort of translation. We need to structure that data. We need to order that data. We need to apply some sort of translata translation to it to actually turn it into information. Now, information is something that has value because information, I can then use the knowledge I've got locked away in my brain and I can use that to then take an action. I can actually do something. It's the important part, what comes next. So we collect the data, we translate the data and then we act on that information we've generated to create a decision to decide we're going to spray this crop or we're going to apply some fertiliser or whatever it is we're going to do. So that's our very basic premise of problem solving in agriculture. Now, where do you fit in? Where does Agritech fit in? Because I tell you what, it's a fairly good sort of a model. You know, collecting the data, translating the data, and then taking action on it. This is something I've built a career out of, uh, nearly 17 years troubleshooting out on farms. It works fine, but fine's not good enough anymore. We need to actually take things to another level. And you know, the reason we're actually very late today is we've actually spent the day in a, in a strategy session looking at the world of, of big data, of smart farming, of pulling in more data streams. And we've spent a whole day playing strategy on this. So, so excuse me if I'm, I'm slightly, uh, the brine's slightly racing here, but uh, I've had a feat of strategy today. So where do I see Agritech playing a role? Well, collecting the data. So one of the teams I run within PGG Wrightson is something called crop monitoring. Now this is a paid service where we actually go out onto orchards across the country and all we do is collect data. We collect insect pest data, disease data, beneficial insect data, we collect nutritional data, we collect data. But I'll be the first to tell you, agriculture and horticulture in New Zealand, we actually need more data. We need more data points. More data points will lead to better decisions. We need simpler, easier, faster ways to collect data. What we need here is we need automation. Like I said, I run a business unit. I have up to about 100 casual staff across the country out there collecting data. And it, honestly, the biggest limitation we have is people. I simply cannot get enough people out there to collect the data we need in these orchard systems to be making the best possible decisions. 
We need automation to achieve our sustainability and production goals in our horticultural systems. My challenge to you, how can you drive remote sensing and the automation of data collection? How can you make this program easier for me so I can capture more data faster? Let's talk about that translating data into information. This is probably where our bread and butter has been. One of the other teams I run is I run our extension services. So these are our industry experts who work alongside our farmers and our sales teams. We're able to translate that data into useful information. We're able to organise it, collate it, interpret it, structure it, and then we're able to present it so that we can actually use something useful out of it. Now, there are a lot of software systems out there that are designed to help process data. Take the data, the big huge barrels of data we're able to capture, and then convert it into something that's useful. However, they are limited in their breadth and their scope. There's limitations to what they can do, and they are very restricted on what data sets they can access and what they can, what they, where they can push that data to. And I, I, I do have to smile a little bit, Kenneth, you actually raised a very good point when you, at the end of your presentation around you know, software systems that don't communicate to each other. You know, we do have this utopian view that some, well, certainly our farmers have this utopian view that there is one software package they'll be able to buy or subscribe to, and it will handle all of their requirements for the future years. That's never going to happen. But what we are going to have to move to is a system where we have different software packages for different aspects of farm and orchard production, but they will have to share and flow data seamlessly between them. No one likes having to input the same data twice. We would love to be input it once and then have it move across the supply chain. So what can you do to help make this translation area more efficient? How can you make it more seamless? What avenues are there for you to create software or work with software that allows for that movement of data through the industry? And the final piece is often the forgotten part of agricultural problem solving. The decision making tools, the okay, so I've got all this data, I know what it's telling me, but what do I do now? And this is the one piece that we often forget. And there is a limited supply of technical experts in New Zealand. In each of our given fields, there's probably only a, a couple of handfuls, 30, 40, 50 people who really know what they're doing in these spaces. And these are going to become a bottleneck for us. Now you think about environmental sustainability. We want more sustainable production out of New Zealand. Um, I just read an MPI paper last week. They think there's another $55 billion worth of production locked up in New Zealand ag and hort, and they want to be able to get it. But the caveat, of course, is it has to be done in a sustainable way. So the only way we're going to be able to do that, more data, more information, and then suddenly we fall over. This decision-making tools. How do we take this information and turn it into something useful for a farmer or a grower to actually be able to act on? So... My challenge to you all, how can you take the knowledge of the experts we've got out there in agriculture, the people who know their stuff, the ag and the haul experts, how can you create something that allows their technical knowledge to reach further? How do you make it a vector, if you will, to allow us to get this technical story, this technical information out to more people? Because that's where we're limited at the moment is the number of people we've got and how many people we can actually service. So that's my, uh, my rant over. Um, what I would then take us to now is perhaps something a little bit more practical. So um, I'm going to get really excited here. Uh, anyone ever heard of potato tuber moth? You have heard of potato tuber moth. Wow, uh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, Congratulations, um, there's two geeks in the room, it's brilliant. Uh, so potato tuber moth is, uh, is a bit of a cosmetic pest. Um, never really caused much of a problem in New Zealand uh, potato industry. Uh, overseas it's been quite a bad pest and there's a lot of control programs, but in New Zealand it's, it's sort of a more of a bit of a novelty. Every now and again you'll find a potato that's got an unusual hole in it, it's not a wireworm, it's a potato tuber moth. That's changed in the last 18 months, two years. So, see all those things flying around in this uh, uh, footage here? Those are potato tuber moths. And before we'd even hung it, they would start to go around here. Well, look how many we have, you know. No wonder we have tuber moth issues in Pukekohe. 
the sticky base is going to need to be changed almost by the end of the day. What? So that's actually the head of my uh, crop monitoring team, Alana Wallace. Um, there, we've never seen pressure like that before. That's to the point that this will probably turn this from being a, uh, a crop of potatoes that will be destined for Australia's export market. They will not make it. They won't even make the New Zealand supermarket. Um, these potatoes will probably be, unless they do take some drastic action now, they won't have uh, be fit for purpose. So, let's think about that problem-solving modality, data to information to a decision. What could you do here? What could we do to help New Zealand Inc., to help Potatoes NZ with the potato tuber moth? Data collection. Um, as you saw there, that beautiful red triangle thing there, that was a, uh, a, an insect trapping plate. Uh, there was a sticky plate on the bottom with a wee cap of pheromone uh, to bring the moths in. Um, as Alana said there, we will be changing that plate daily. So I'm see we're sending someone out, they're driving out to that paddock, they'll be walking into the paddock, they'll be collecting that plate, they'll be taking it back, and they will be counting the number of moth on it. And they will be doing that daily. That is a huge cost to the grower to be able to get someone to do this. How can we automate that? Surely there must be ways we are able to automate that dart collection. How can we find ways to, to speed that process up, to make it more efficient and make it more cost effective for our growers? Information translation. I mean, once we've collected all this data, we know the, the numbers of potato tuber moth that are out there. We know the predators that are out there. We're able to track and monitor those life cycles. Once we've got all this information, we need to be able to translate that. We need to be able to put that into a form that our growers can use. We need to be able to do it faster and more efficient. At the moment, it's people manually crunching numbers and then passing it back to the growers and letting them make a decision. What could we do to speed that process up, to help them there? And finally, it's that decision support. It needs to be simple and it needs to be widespread. We have a problem that's localised in Pukekohe at the moment. It is spreading rapidly. It will be into the South Island within the next year to 18 months. That's how fast these little blighters can travel. Um, what are we going to be able to do here to be able to help these growers? We grow about 30,000 hectares of potatoes in New Zealand. They're a major export and internal crop for us. Um, they're a major part of our horticultural offering. We need to be able to decision support our growers here. Let them know that, you know, the good old days of spraying potato tuber moth would have just been, you know, find the biggest, nastiest, ugliest insecticide you've got in your shed and then spray it onto the paddock until nothing moves. Yeah, I, you know exactly what I'm talking about there. And, and look, that's not acceptable anymore. Our, our consumers don't want that. They will not tolerate that. Our overseas markets will not tolerate that. We need to look at better ways to do it. And the only way we can do it is by having good decision support. Capture that data, translate it effectively, and have that good decision support. So we need to know, you know at what point should I use a nasty product to try and reduce the numbers, and then at what point should I use softer chemistry, biological chemistry even, to try and keep the predator insects that are alive in there, the parasitic wasps and the lacewings and the hoverflies, keep them alive, but still manage to get some level of control on the tuber moth. We need to be able, we've got the expertise to be able to create those programs. We don't have the manpower on the ground to be able to push that information out. What role could you play in an agri-tech uh, sector to actually push this information out to everyone. That was my challenge for you, trying to bring it a little bit more real world. I have probably gone over my 10 minutes, well and truly. If anyone does have any questions, I will be floating around. By all means, call me and let's have a chat. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Have we got any quick questions now for Milton? No, no. To well done. Brilliant, thank you. And this, this is the grand finale. This is what we've been waiting for all evening. This is the last presentation this afternoon. Uh, Robin Cox from Christchurch NZ. We're going to finish on a high. Going to You're right. <laughs> okay, thanks. So um, 
because I am the, um, the last speaker, I will try and um, summarise up some of what we've heard, is that my understanding, from Graham. So um, I've been rapidly, um, I've been listening very attentively, <coughs> that's what I should be saying. So um, first up, I'll just let you know who I am. And um, so I'm, as like you, said, like you just heard, I'm Robin Cox, and I, my title at Christchurch NZ is the Food and Fibre Specialist. And I really, really detest the word specialist on the end. But um, basically, my job there at Christchurch CNZ is to um, be the connector within our business, anything to do with food, fibre and agri-tech. Um, I was just listening as well. We found out that most of you in the room are from industry which is great for me because um, in my role that's a really important part. But um, what I'm wondering, and I think it's really important to ask that first, is who here um, can tell me what they think? And, I'm, and you need to do this. We need to speed this up. Um, give me a couple of quick ideas of what you think Christchurch NZ is as a business. Any clue at all? Start of 10. There are 13 bottles of wine. Maybe somebody could get something from that. So um, Christchurch NZ, anyone put your hand, maybe show of hands. Who's heard of Christchurch NZ? All right, well, that's a pretty good start. Why do you think Christchurch NZ would have a food and fibre specialist there? Any clue on that one? Are you yep. about putting industries together and bringing them to Christchurch? Uh, definitely part of their job. And what, in what role um, can you think of at Christchurch Zen, the conduit of um, what became Christchurch Zen from a lot of different um, sectors, including the Canterbury Development Corporation? Um, that's where my role sits. So I work in a pillar, so Christchurch Zen is involved in destination um, and uh, events, which is what most people are kind of have a synonymous uh, idea about uh, Christchurch CNZ, but in actual fact, what a lot of people don't understand it, it is actually an economic development agency. And where I work in the innovation and business growth team is one of the largest units in there. So that's something I thought I would say first because I know people look at me sometimes and what on earth are you working at Christchurch CNZ for? But that's where I work. Um, so just um, moving on from here, so in my role, um, I work, I'm not allowed to move, sorry. <laughs> Can't go there. In my role, um, I work with the Canterbury Mural Forum, which spreads from Waimati to Kaikaura, and I work in what's called the Food and Fibre Innovation Programme. So my stakeholders, like I said, range from um, anybody in the food and fibre sector from Waimata to Kaikoura, which for one person is a significant number of stakeholders to keep happy, as you can imagine. Um, but the main, um, my main focus is to increase the value-added food and fibre production here in Canterbury. And that's why Agritech is such a significant part of where my role is, is starting to head. Now, just to give you a heads up, I've only just started in mid-January. And uh, so... If you take COVID out of um, COVID out of the picture, we're just starting to ramp up what our program is and how we can deliver on that promise um, at the moment. Super nodes. Anyone got a clue about what the super nodes are? Any show of hands on that one? We like a little wee one there. <laughs> um, so the super nodes were um, pre my time. They were developed. Uh, a little over a year ago, as a way of actually capturing where they think that high value um, industry in Canterbury could be um, super focused to ramp up GDP, grow good value, um, value jobs and really um, spearhead technology because that's where we want to be. We want to be really future focused as a region. And you can see there that Food Fibre and Agri-Tech are one of those four super nodes. And if you, take, if you can read the numbers there, you can see that it has a significant latent potential of economic impact opportunity comparative even with the other three super nodes, which is why I work at Christchurch NZ. Um, 
So, like I said, I work in the innovation and business growth team. Um, we have a really strong communications and marketing uh, sector as well through the destination and attraction team, and I can um, hook into the comms department for any of the work that I do. And that really allows me to ramp up um, the changing that perception story around the sector between the city environs and what is outside, um, outside the gates, if you like, of the city. So that's one of the pink pieces of work. Um, business growth and mentoring, now that has been one of the busiest teams, as you could imagine, uh, during this COVID period. And they run, um, they were contracted to do a lot of that business support and um, post-COVID. But they're also there to, uh, in their outside COVID, to be working with um, businesses large and small, uh, startups, entrepreneurs, and really wrapping around a, um, some business support around them. Growing talent, inside my team we actually have two talent specialists and they work really closely with the universities. Uh, and <coughs> in fact my line manager is on the uh, regional skills leadership group and helping shape out what the future of education will be like. And that includes a food and fibre lens and what does the food and fibre sector need for that. And this last bit is really what I'm going to be talking about because the brief I got was to let you know why, what the importance of collaboration is to actually meet those goals. And that is the primary part of my goal. So, um, so what did we do? Um, about a year ago, the, um, again, pre my time, there was um, a realisation that we've got these innovative, we've got these hubs of innovation ecosystem, but there was a bit of a disjointed uh, space out there and it wasn't particularly clear, um, not only to entrepreneurs and innovators, but even to large businesses about where people went and where, who were the right, where were the but where was the right point of contact to actually ramp up a business or connect with a business or even find a, an innovator of an entrepreneur? So we went from this, and each one of those jigsaw pieces is, was a really beautiful um, piece of a puzzle. They were all working uh, hard to try and ramp up innovation and entrepreneurship, but they were doing it in, in a way that was tended to be quite isolated, and there were some um, inefficiencies with that. And so what we've worked on, and very, we've worked, put a lot of time and energy into this, is actually trying to make it a look a bit more like that. And why I chose that image on uh, Google Images was uh, because it's left these pieces on the, um, on the side. There's plenty more to hook in on that, and we're still working now at building that more and more and more. So we went from this, I won't go, I'm literally going to fast track my talk, <laughs> and with this here is a little bit of an example of what that innovation ecosystem has started to look like and trying to create better lines of sight. So each part of our innovation ecosystem understands what their target market is, understands um, who they're there to serve. They're all working collaboratively together, don't get me wrong, but it just means that for anybody in, in any stage of that innovation pathway has a much clearer and much more guided journey through that space. So take students, for example. If you're a university student, there's some excellent, um, there's a centre of entrepreneurship here. And so you could be going into, go from the centre of entrepreneurship to Think Lab, as can um, any number of entrepreneurs. And as you commercialise your business, you could be working with a regional partners network, etc., amplifier programs, the Think Lab expansion, and this is where we're going to next. We're wanting to get some deep tech incubators here in Canterbury. We figure if we can get the front end working more collaboratively in a much more cogent way, then the, um, the investors will be seeing us as a better um, bet to actually um, put a deep tech uh, incubator here. We want to connect people much more tightly with research institutes and I'll talk to you the power we're going to be doing that and the industry partnerships are a significant part of what my role is going to evolve to. Uh, 
I've started doing it in a small way. So there's been um, in, um, connecting the industry into the innovation ecosystem. And I was just wanting to pop up here a letter from just a, he's a CEO. I've uh, blanked out all of the commercially sensitive parts because he, it was around some research and development, which um, I don't have permission to share all the details of. But I connected him with Graham. I, I was talking to him about what, how his product innovation, it's an extremely innovative product, uh, what he was doing, and he was telling me about how he was connecting with someone in Europe, he was talking to people in Auckland, and, I, and there, were engineering, um, there were engineering issues he was trying to overcome, and I said, well, I'm going to say, I mean, have you not been to UC Engineering? It's like outrageously exciting. There's so many wicked things happening there. And he, he literally, um, his business is about two kilometres from the university, had no idea what you did there. And so I connected him in with Graham, and this is his response after a visit. And you'll see that not only, actually I'd better go onto the screen because I can't read from there, but um, first thing he says, what an incredible resource we have on our door. And I'm sure that that is actually reflective, not of the people in this room, because you're here for a reason and because you are aware of what we do here, but we have no shortage of talent in this province. We have no shortage of absolute cutting edge expertise, but what we do have is a lack of connection between industry and, um, and those different players in that research and innovation space. So what Christchurch and Z have started doing is creating or looking at, we, I can't say that it's happened yet, we're actually at looking at creating clusters to build that social capital. And clusters are well used right throughout the world. They've been used for a long time in Scandinavian countries. They've been highly successful in Ireland and they actually attribute it to a significant part of their economic growth there. Uh, Germany, uh, Holland are uh, significant users of a cluster strategy for driving growth, as is uh, Canada and parts of the United States. It's not something, cluster unfortunately, COVID times is not the best <laughs> word. Um, I'm really thinking we might have to try and think of a better word than that. But it is, if you Google cluster uh, development or clusters in economic development, you'll see lots and lots of stuff popping up. And they, uh, they really can drive, um, they really can drive innovation. They really can um, ramp up regional growth. And it's done in a particular way. So first up, you look at the region. It has to be a region. So the region isn't New Zealand. The region in this case is going to be Canterbury. They need to be a geographical proximity for them to really work. Yeah. They also um, need to be something that is synonymous. Oh, I'm getting a bit of a way there. They need to be synonymous with what the sector actually already um, is already happening here. So you don't just make it up. You don't go, oh my gosh, we're going to be the next best X, Y, Z. You have a look and see what is actually happening here, what is going well. And, um, and you also want to think that there's already some clustering going on where people are already collaborating. And so my job as um, a cluster manager will be just to sort of put a wrap around service there and be the connector and do some of that heavy lifting around getting that group going. So just quickly, we looked at um, five areas that we thought had potential here in Canterbury to cluster. And Agritech is going to be our first pilot cluster. This has been an advertorial. Um, why? It's really well aligned to central government uh, priorities. And um, there's already amazing champions and amazing um, innovation happening here. So if we can cluster that together, what it won't be, it will not be replicating what Agritech NZ does. That has got its own special space. All it is is around building that social capital. And that's what industry is really looking for. So it's not, like I say, it's not replicating anything that an industry good body will be doing. It's not replicating um, other initiatives. Clustering is a social capital to start with. And from that social capital, it's knowing, it's when you're in the know, it's rubbing shoulders with people, it's building that trust circle. It's not about sharing IP. 
it's around about seeing where those burning platforms are that some of which I've listened to today, where those burning platforms are, where the solutions are, and <coughs> as an economic development agency, I can um, create the opportunity for that meeting to happen, and I can also um, hear what the issues are, and I can uh, connect people to those solutions. So uh, I just need to give you one quick thing to know as well, is that the Food Fibre Agritech um, Supernode is having its very first challenge here in uh, Christchurch uh, or Canterbury and it's kicking off in a couple of weeks. It's a collaboration between Blink and U University of Canterbury on delivery along with KiwiNet AgriSearch and the Canterbury Mirror Forum as well. It has, uh, there's going to be a researcher um, section, so please, researchers. There's uh, $130,000 of prize money in total. 50000 of it will be guaranteed to go to a researcher, which could be a university or CRI researcher. It could also be a PhD student working um, with... Um, within a university, and the others are enterprises. So if Wrightsons have got some new innovation they haven't commercialised yet, or Ravensdown they haven't commercialised it yet, by all means enter this competition. It's a really good way of starting that clustering as well, starting to network. Not only um, is there $130,000 worth of prize money, there's in-kind prizes, there's going to be a um, significant um, amount of comms about this. It, like I said, it kicks off in two weeks. It doesn't finish till May, May next year, and it's going to be launched at the BOMA. The uh, finale will be at the BOMA conference. So lots of opportunity to really get out there. Um, if you know some young innovators and entrepreneurs, please let them know about it. We've not had something of that scale here in Canterbury before. We're really excited by it. Um, yeah, and if, uh, if you want to contact me by email about the clustering, please do. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Bob. I never got to sum up. <laughs> Any quick questions for Robin? Yes. Uh, no, 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 it was you. Oh, oh okay. Um, uh, I have two questions. Yeah, the sure. The first one is who, is you, who are you funded by? The Canterbury Merrill Forum. The Canterbury Merrill Forum, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that answers my second question, which is. Which um, is a Shane's Jones sort of no, 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 money. No, 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 it's around, uh, you talked that your area was from Waimati to Kaikoura. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in Timaru. Yes. Why would we use you rather than Venture Timaru? Oh, you, you don't have to make a choice. I work with Venture Timaru as well. So um, as an economic development agency, what we do is we do the bits here that why Christchurch NZ does it. We can offer a different range of products and um, what Venture Timaru, Timaru they're working, they work in the same ecosystem as I do. Yeah. So if, yeah. you're, if you're the Canterbury Regional Forum, yep. why are you called Christchurch NZ and not Canterbury NZ? Well, that's a marketing question that was not my decision. And that, if I had a bottle of wine for every time someone asked me that question, I wouldn't be able to walk out this door. So, um, yeah, understand a lot of... That's why I asked the question at the start. It's a, there is some uncertainty about what that brand does. Let's hope that the Agritech Challenge will start getting that, um, start getting that bit sorted. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Robin. All right. Appreciate that. And you'll be around to, uh, to ask be. more questions as yeah, well? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Well, that was 12 amazing presentations in a shade. Can I double click? In a shade over two hours. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, I'd like you to just thank you all our presenters again. Uh, for taking their time out to come and present here today. So if you did enjoy this, then we do actually have a, a, another one coming up in January around sustainability. So um, there is no fixed date for that yet, but uh, stay post. We've got your email addresses uh, and we will send you some more information about that. There's, uh, there's no escaping. Um, 
As I mentioned several times this evening, if you have a look in your bags, uh, you'll have all the contacts to our presenters here today. Um, continue the conversation and, uh, and connect with them if there's, uh, there's more information that you want to find out. Outside now, there should be some people uh, with banners um, for electrical and computer engineering, for mechanical engineering, and for chemical and process engineering. If you're interested in taking a tour around their facilities, please just join one of them, and, uh, and they'll be leaving shortly. And I think we've got to give Ted Ken uh, time to get out there, because I think he's going he's gonna to tour, <laughs> tour some groups around as well. Uh, if you don't want to do a tour, please stay. Please have some drinks, nibbles, and, uh, and just connect with the speakers and each other. Thank you very much for coming. And just one note to all the speakers, can you grab a bottle of wine before you leave, please? Thank you.